thank you all for coming and uh, thank you all for spending your lives researching this topic so that we can get accurate information um, on what is going on. So I guess to start off, um, the first question I guess I'd like, I guess let me, let me explain some of the purpose here. For some reason there seems to be a disconnect with society. Um, I've seen your lectures today, all three of you. Um, they were great, but they were tough to listen to because you basically painted a picture that the direction we're going, if we don't make changes, there are going to be consequences that people are not going to like. Um, so part of our goal is to somehow uh, at least get everyone to be aware of what you're saying so that the best of human capabilities can be focused on this. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions and ask you to tell us research, but the question is, I'm not the first person that's asked these questions. There's been articles written, there's been books written, you've written these books, smart people have heard this. If you're right, talking about such important and such urgent and such critical things, what's happened when you've told people? In other words, you're well-respected, you know, credentialed people. When you've told the president, the governor, the senator, the head of, the, of, of wherever, what's happened? I mean, how come this isn't on the front page of the newspaper every day? Why isn't this on the, you know, the headline news every day? Why isn't everyone responding? I mean, w w you know, this information is clear. These books are very clear. They're not confusing. Why hasn't the top people heard what you said and gone on TV and said, we have a crisis and we're going to deal with it? What, what's preventing this information from being acted on by the highest levels of, of our society? Anyone who would like to respond? Well, that's, scientists aren't always the best communicators. And there are a lot of scientists out there who can't talk to the general public in terms that the general public understands. They're talking up here with highly technical terms, multisyllabic words and they don't always make personal contact with people. Um, so that's one side of the problem. Another side of the problem is that politicians don't tend to think in the long term. I mean, these are long term things. Politician thinks in terms of two years or four years uh, because they, there's a re-election, you know. There's another campaign, another, another election. And um, this long-term stuff, they don't all see that this is so necessary to tackle. And it's easier to tackle other things. That's just a start. I could keep going, but I'll let my colleagues have some. Yes, uh, I, I'd agree, uh, especially with the, your second point about the uh, politicians. Uh, the reason why um, action isn't being taken urgently is, is the fact that politicians generally feel if, it, if it's not going to affect me in, uh, and my re-election chances in the next two or three years, we needn't bother with it. And um, it, it's a very depressing approach that they have but you can see why when they're, they're confronted with a, a mass of immediate problems uh, that that they would rather kick the can down the road when it comes to something that isn't going to immediately cause a catastrophe uh, the trouble is that that stops being true when it does start when when the, the changes of climate are actually starting to cause immediate catastrophes for instance this last year with the uh, uh, the hurricanes and, and uh, floods, those those can be demonstrated to, to have been exacerbated by climate change if not caused by them. And so you, the, the massive costs involved uh, make it clear that you, 
America, for instance, can't just pretend that these things aren't happening because the, the, the balance of cost between dealing with, having to deal with catastrophes and actually not having the catastrophes because you've taken some action on a global scale, um, it be becomes, begins to become sort of glaringly obvious. So what one hopes is that the, the uh, when, when things like s go wrong faster and faster, as, as is the case, everything is, is getting wrong in an exponential way, that uh, at, the, at, at a certain point, then people will realize, in, including politicians, that you have to actually uh, take serious action serious actions which may impact your, the, uh, the way of life of people. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it, I think it's getting close. Well, um, we're dealing with a lot of uh, um, dynamics in the situation you describe, and one of the most important ones is the institutional inertia that we have out there. Uh, uh, we are a society composed of many, many, many powerful institutions that are, you know, they're, they're organized around missions, around money, um, around all kinds of uh, rallying points for them. And uh, many of these institutions have gatekeepers who um, are dedicated to keeping messengers out of the arena if they are bearing messages that are disturbing. Uh, by the way, we see this most clearly these days on campus. And um, where the, the idea of uh, inclusion now means uh, shutting down conversations and debate. So how we got to that insane point in our culture is a kind of an interesting dynamic. Uh, there's also something like the Pareto Principle. There's actually a law named after uh, another guy whose name I forget, but it, it's sort of like the Pareto Principle of, of 80% and the 20% in, in any institution or corporation or business. 80% of the people uh, are basically devoted to the survival of the institution at all costs, and only 20% are devoted to actually carrying out the mission uh, and doing the work of the institution. So institutions themselves are powerfully motivated to maintain a status quo. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that we tend to forget in our wishfulness about the world and our, our constant uh, effort to build new utopias is that reality has mandates of its own and that uh, ultimately it will be the circumstances uh, of our lives and of reality that will probably compel us to do things differently whether we like it or not. You know, a lot of our, uh, a lot, there's a lot of thinking out there these days that th the world revolves around our preferences and likes and dislikes. And in fact, there, there are a lot of things about the universe uh, that are not concerned with our preferences and dislikes. It has its own agenda. And, uh, and our societies, of, you know, organized human societies composed of individuals have to adapt to the uh, circumstances that reality is presenting to us at a given time, or not. And also, one, one final thing. Something that's been removed from the liberal education that uh, used to be at the center of it was the idea that life is tragic. And uh, by that, I don't mean that everything comes out badly or sadly, but the idea that uh, there are consequences to the choices that we make. And, um, and uh, we, we better make good choices. And, and often we don't. And when we don't make good choices, there are consequences. I, I actually have a new theory of history, which is things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time. So I could simplify this. I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I think when it comes to climate change and ocean acidification and 
biodiversity loss and deforestation and extinction of animals and all these different things, the real question that people say in their minds is, no matter what it is you say, they say to themselves, when will this actually affect me? And as long as people say, by 2100, you've already lost them. They're like, 2100, I'm good. If, no matter what happens, if it's happening in 2100, they're good. So most people believe, no matter what you say when you talk about climate change, that you're talking about something that is still 50 plus years away. Now, we had a speaker named Guy McPherson who came, and he was, t he was simply terrifying. He was saying that um, human beings are not being accurate, and we're about to have an acceleration in climate change, which is going to affect everything and food and everything. And he was saying that we are now in a, abrupt climate change, aggressive climate change. So the real reason that people are not that interested in this subject is they think you're talking about a subject that will affect us in the year, affect them in a meaningful way in 2100. So the, the question that, the horrible question that I have to ask is, okay, so with ocean acidification and overfishing and species extinction and the warming and everything, when does it affect humans? When do we go to the gross, is there not enough food? When is the storms so consistently like Puerto Rico? When are the, the tropical malaria coming to here? When do we get to the point that our society is significantly interfered with? Because if you say it's 100 years away, 50 years away, you know, a lot of people are gonna be relieved. How much time do we have before all these things create significant interference in our ability to feed ourselves and have a normal society? And it's a horrible question, but that's the, that's the real thing that people don't want to know but want to know. I should think that Hurricane Sandy and Harvey and Irma and Maria and a bunch of other and Katrina should have hit a lot of people where they live. Uh, you know, things have happened, and there is going to be, they're going to run out of water in Cape Town, South Africa. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are happening now. Uh, perhaps it didn't happen in your town or your state, but certainly there have been many major major things that have happened and are going to continue to happen in an even uh, more severe way. Uh, you know, if we have to appeal to people only by what's personally going to happen to you, unless people have some thoughts about their kids or grandkids that they're concerned about their future or concerned about the rest of the life on the planet, um, I, I find it very frustrating if I have to tell each individual person, you know, something bad will happen to you, because that may not at all be the case. Um, yes, a couple of points on, on, uh, on what you just said. Uh, one uh, is the speed at which things are happening in climate change is in itself increasing. If most of the changes now are exponential. The, the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, and the, the, the rate of rise of sea level, for instance, global sea levels, these are increasing exponentially, not, not linearly. And the, tr the thing about an exponential, as uh, some, somebody said, is that if you're standing on an exponential curve and you look behind you, it's all flat and, and and doesn't look as if much is happening. So therefore, you needn't worry very much because nothing much has happened so far. Um, and But when you look ahead, you're going up a vertical cliff. Um, and most people prefer to look at what's happened so far and they sort of think, well, nothing much has happened, we're okay. Um, and that's that's the sort of, dis dis that's the, uh, uh, the problem with an exponential change is that you don't realize it's happening until it's too late. Um, and then the inverse of that was a, a, a quite a, a astonishing statement that came from a British government minister when, when the last uh, assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out. Um, he said 
well, I've seen this report, and, and it's, only, it's only forecasting a sort of two and a half degrees of warming, and half of that's already happened. And in other words, what he thought was that because the IPCC projections only go out to the year 2000, uh, sorry, 2100, that therefore climate change would stop in 2100. So if half of the w climate change is ever going to happen has already happened, uh, and therefore we don't have to worry because when we get to 2100, uh, climate change will stop. So that, that was this astonishing British government minister now no longer in office. But uh, it illustrates the way politicians think. Okay. Um, one of the dynamics that we're dealing with uh, is the fact that uh, uh, systems theory really applies to many of the, the forces that are now in motion around us. And, and, you know, what systems theory will tell us is that systems tend to keep on doing what they do until they reach a point of criticality and then they go through what's called phase change where you know they move from one state to another often a state of ap apparent stability to wild instability um, this is obvious in nature but it's probably also uh, you know going to prove to be obvious in, in in human social dynamics and the way that we're responding to these things uh, and you know the the short answer to that is that we probably won't be moved to do much of anything until we're compelled to, and then it will all be a very impromptu process. You know, the, the, there are two forms of extreme psychological uh, narcissism that I observe around me today. One of them is what I call techno-narcissism. You know, the idea that uh, we're going to come up with technological rescue remedies that will uh, make everything all right. And the other type is organizational narcissism, where we think we're going to organize our way through this set of predicaments. And I'm more inclined to think that uh, society being the emergent phenomenon that they are, phenomena that they are, suggests that um, you know, they are self-organizing and they, they will respond to the circumstances that the time and place presents. And sometimes it's a very disorderly reaction. So disorder is one of the options here. Uh, it, to, for us, one of the questions really is, you know, that we ought to put to the, to the people, to the nation, is, well, how much disorder do you want? So I guess the, the question that I want to just ask is, um, again, are we having climate change or are we having abrupt climate change? Meaning, are, you, are we saying that you know, this is a bad thing and by 2050 sea levels are gonna rise and by 2070, or are you saying, no, people aren't understanding, it is accelerating too fast. In, in other words, there's, there's a, a simple question I could ask to say differently. I could just say, how many degrees can the planet heat up and humans can survive and how many degrees did we go up last year? So if you're saying we can only go up six degrees Celsius, and we went up a tenth of a percent, that would mean there's only 60 years left that you could be. So I'm trying to understand, are we dealing with a problem that is very bad and we've got to solve over the next 50 plus years? Or are we dealing with a problem that's very bad that literally um, could prevent us from continuing as a species in the next 15 years? I'm trying to understand the, how advanced this is, and I don't want to overreact, and I don't want to be scary. On the other hand, I don't want to be um, falsely optimistic that this is a problem for uh, my children. I, I think um, it's about halfway in between um, something that's going to do a sin in 50 years or something that's going to do a sin in 15 years. But uh, it, it's, it's uh, the problem is that, that the, it's this acceleration effect that um, we've already got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than will cause a two degree warming. 
and the the reason why the, the, the two degree figure was pulled out of pulled out it was pulled out of the air to some extent uh, as it had there had to be some temperature rise that was regarded as acceptable and some value that was regarded as unacceptable and so to some extent this was a political figure but it also there was a real there was a, a reality behind it in that if you warm the climate by more than two degrees there's a lot of crops which start to to give very much lower yields and, and wither away so there'd be a real uh, crisis in global food production if we warm up beyond two degrees and a lot of other effects as well in the rate of of sea level rise will increase very fast but the, the but the trouble is we already have enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to take us beyond two degrees it, it's because the the warming is is not instantly realized it takes years for that extra carbon dioxide to exert its effect through the climate system but even if we never emit any more um, we'll get our two degrees of, of warming and all the consequences from it. So we're on a, there's a kind of flywheel or ratchet which is, which is driving us on. Uh, and I think the, the fear of the people who are very uh, pessimistic about our future is that if we don't really do something very, very serious to stop things, that's what will happen. And you can, you can have a, see a timetable at which various uh, irreversible effects will have happened. And, and it's, the, it's the business as usual scenario, which they, the intergovernmental panel stopped using because it sounded too bad. But in fact, it's in their scenarios of how the future will go, they, they, they have an optimistic one when we become sane and rational and we uh, uh, stop emitting carbon dioxide. There's a business as usual one, and then there's a let's let rip on everything scenario, a sort of Donald Trump type scenario. So their early uh, assessments of, the, of what's happening to the planet had three scenarios, and then, then they thought that was too easy. People would understand that and might get really worried, so they deliberately complicated things later. But on the business as usual scenario, which is the one that we're following, which is we're not... That the, the rate of rise of CO2 and other gases is as if we weren't doing anything uh, to stop it, it is just letting it uh, go its own way. But that on that, that scenario, you can, you can plot out at which year we reach certain numbers of degrees of warming, and at the moment it, it's, it's, it's having us get about four to five degrees of warming by the end of the century, which... Um, it may not wipe us out as a species, as, uh, uh, as a, um, the most pessimistic people would say, but it, it would make it would wipe us out as a civilized species. We would be at, at four to five degrees of warming. The, the large areas of the planet would become very di uninhabitable. There would be uh, deserts where where the present a lot of southern Europe would become a desert. And, and you can see how the world, w the human race, would have a great deal of difficulty in, in surviving as a, as a functioning uh, organism in, in, in that time. And that's, that's the end of the, s the century. And, and the bad things would be happening way, way before that. So probably we are talking about, say, 20 years before we have such serious consequences that we really notice and of course we're really noticing this, y this year from various disasters i just want to add to that um the effects of sea level rise are already being seen in small island nations that are um you know not mountainous but flat uh island nations that realize within a few decades they're going to be underwater and some of them are making plans to move to higher islands and um, that give up their homeland i mean this is their country and they know they're not going to have it anymore so we are going to have not only those people 
but people fleeing from places that will have gotten too hot to grow crops. We're going to have climate refugees. I mean, we have enough issues about refugees now. Uh, there are some people that argue that a lot of the Syrian issues were because of climate problems. That's, you know, some people think that's true and some people don't. But there will be undoubtedly huge numbers of climate refugees within the next few decades. And, and what that will do with international politics or wars or whatever, who knows? <clears throat> There's a, uh, a third intellectual conceit that I forgot to mention, uh, along with the techno-narcissism and organizational narcissism. There's an idea that, uh, and it, you know, it comes from um, uh, the, uh, obviously comes from sort of the technocratic and scientific uh, uh, sector, but I think it's a sort of a dangerous idea, the idea that if you can measure enough stuff, you can control everything. And we're finding out now that, uh, yeah, we can measure a lot of things, you know, and, th and then we're disappointed that we, that we can't control it or that we can't rouse up enough of a political, of a potent enough political mechanism to change our behavior. Um, I don't think that any amount of hand-wringing about these issues is going to help that situation. Um, and there's some funny elements of it, too, that, that have to do with uh, the, uh, uh, the, the intellectual life of our culture. You know, uh, how many of you are familiar with Nassim Taleb, author of The, the um, Black Swan and Fooled by Randomness and other books? Never heard of the Black Swan, huh? Well, um, Taleb has a new um, uh, phrase that he's been using to describe the behavior of the intellectual classes in, in America. He, he refers to them as intellectual yet idiots. People who are obviously highly educated and highly intelligent, and yet they behave like, like idiots. And uh, I, I've seen a couple of really uh, uh, vivid examples of that in my travels in recent years. One, and they're institutional, uh, so they should be of interest to us. If we're interested why institutions are not functioning well enough to bring these issues uh, I into the arena, uh, one of them is the Rocky Mountain Institute, you know, a, v a very famous and highly esteemed environmental organization. They had a program back in the early 2000s to develop a hypercar, as they called it. This was going to be their solution to the, uh, the problem of happy motoring and climate change and warming and too much CO2 in the atmosphere. They were going to develop cars that got such wonderful, supernaturally great mileage that we would be able to continue living the suburban happy motoring life uh, because we'd have better cars. And this was from an environmental organization uh, of people who were considered to be major intellectuals in, you know, in, in, in our country. Amory Lovins in, particularly, in particular, who runs the organization. You know, nobody stopped to ask themselves, you know, does this idea of the hypercar, what, it, what, what is its net effect? The net effect is that it promotes the idea that we can continue living the way we're living now in this insane suburban living arrangement, you know, and that was an environmental organization. So, you know, one of the lessons of that, I'm starting to ramble on, but I do want to make this point. Um, one of the lessons of that is if you can't depend on the, the you know, the highly accredited uh, intellectuals in your culture to think clearly, who, you can, who are you going to rely on? Huh? You know, the, just the boobs at the corner bar. You know, the guy sitting in the gutter with a bottle of Muscatel. You know, some dumb politician. You know, so w what we're seeing is tremendous failure in the intellectual life of our country. I saw another really wonderful kind of amusing example in Houston. Uh, I, I gave a spiel at Rice University, and it was sponsored by the environmental uh, school there, which had been the School of Forestry previously. And uh, so they took me on a tour of the facilities at the environmental school. And he here's what they were doing. It was summer, and so they had to air condition 
most of the building to a supernatural level of coolness in order to keep the computers happy. And then they had to turn the heat on so people could work in this environment. And these were the environmental professors at Rice University. You know, these weren't the janitors, you know, who made this decision. So if you can't depend on those people to think clearly, uh, I, I, I'd say that we're pretty lost. Thank <laughs> you.